Hi guys, welcome to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bomiga Azilupindo. I am a clinical psychologist by profession and I'm also doing my doctorate at the University of Oxford. So I've been trying to get back into creating content for my YouTube channel and I asked my Instagram page if you guys had any questions, any videos you were hoping to see. If you don't already follow me on Instagram, I will leave my Instagram handle below so that you guys can get involved in conversations and get the opportunity to also share some of the videos that you guys would like to see. So I will get into some of the stuff that you guys have asked on the page. And I'll also at the end of the video, let you guys know some of the videos that you can expect in the future, given what you guys asked. So I've tried to group these questions based on their similarities. So the first question is, what are you up to now? So I am currently doing my doctorate at the University of Oxford. I also do work part time in London at an eating disorder facility but most of my time is spent on my actual doctorate. The next question is the PhD process. And I guess this also ties into the next couple of questions, which is how's your PhD going, your current PhD journey and your life update. So I did share a video on the process in which I got to Oxford. So please do have a look at that. But in terms of the actual PhD process itself, so Oxford has a process that's different from some of the PhD programs I've been exposed to specifically in South Africa. So with Oxford, you have three different assessments that you have to go through. The first one is a transfer of status. So this happens at the end of your first year as a PhD student. So initially you are a probationary student and at the end of your first year, you have an assessment where you present the work that you've been doing over the past year and also what you plan to do for the rest of your PhD process. And based on that, then you then become an official PhD student. So I am currently at my transfer of status stage. I literally have my transfer of status coming up this Tuesday. So right now I'm preparing for that. The second assessment that you have is closer to the end of your PhD. So this is the confirmation of status. So essentially just confirming that you will be completing your PhD at the stipulated time. And essentially this is still a few years away from me. I'm anticipating doing mine in around September, November of 2025 if everything goes as planned and then the final one is your final viva exam where you basically defend your phd so right now i'm at the first stage which is a year into my phd which is transfer of status so at this point i have done a systematic review i still have three other studies that we're planning to do one qualitative one quantitative and one is an experimental intervention. Should I do a PhD at home or overseas? Honestly, this is very personal. <laughs> I think it depends on what your PhD is. So for example, my PhD is focused on South Africa. So the work that I'm doing is essentially based in South Africa. It's for South Africa. And honestly, I could have done the research at home and it probably would have been easier to do the research at home so that you don't have to go through different ethical processes and, and having to do ethics from a distance and relying on third parties that can make things a bit difficult. So I do find that probably might have been easier if I actually done my research at home. But my decision to come to Oxford was also informed by the fact that I have funding here. So I think those are big determining factors. So firstly, thinking about what kind of research you want to do, who is an expert in the field of that research and people you might want to work with. These people might be based in South Africa or the UK or other institutions. So that would be something that informs where you want to go. And then lastly, thinking about funding opportunities. Are there more funding opportunities? opportunities in other countries but again it's very project specific some projects already have like funding allocated to them versus for my study I literally had to get like an external funder because this was a project I was initiating versus if you join a project that's already existing it might have funding for you so it's a very personal decision so I'd say think about project itself supervisor funding and that could be the first basis of things. And then secondly, thinking about where you would get support. 
doing a PhD is honestly really hard and I think it's it tends to be better when you're in a space where you have a sense of community and of course this is something that you can build both at home and also overseas. For me the fact that I came on a scholarship where we came with several people and I was already part of this big Rhodes community it made it so much easier for me to have community before I even got to Oxford and when I got to Oxford it also helped facilitate that so that could also be something that you think about and also in terms of your own personal characteristics are you someone that relies a lot on familiar environments familiar people family structure is that something that's going to be taken away from you are you someone that's easily adaptable to different contexts and the various stuff that you could also think about that are more personal characteristics the other question is also quite linked to this one which is advice on what to do after masters so honestly after masters again very personal decision for me i wanted to jump immediately into a phd but my supervisors advised me not to do that and i really appreciate it because part of what they said was go into the field get a bit of experience and see where you can mo make the most impact and i feel like the current research that i'm doing is largely informed by the work that i've done and by the experience that i've gained so i would recommend that if you're interested in doing a phd honestly give yourself a bit of time get into the work see where you can actually make an impact see what your interests are because a phd is very long my program is three to five years other universities actually start at five years so that might be something you really want to think about because you're going to be working on this project for a good five years so these questions also tie into existing videos so i'm just going to link you guys up to to the videos that I've previously made that answer these questions. The first one is how to structure your master's autobiography. So I do have an extensive video on master's application where I talk through the entire application process. If you do watch that video and you find that your questions are still unanswered, please do send through specific questions in relation to the autobiography and then I can try to address those. And then how to practice in the UK. Also, I've shared another video on when I moved to the UK, how I registered with, with HCPC. So that is also a very useful video that's going to help to answer this question. And just an add on in relation to the application process itself. I think one thing that I'd also like to advise people on is the fact that when you are applying with HCPC in South Africa, most of us and I think a large part of us are trained in English we go through all our education in English most of our engagements are in English so on the application form itself you will be asked is your first language English or do you have like another native language that is your first language yes for some of us I find that your home language is different from English and you might consider that as being your first language whereas in actual fact you might be a lot more fluent in English than you are even in your home language so when filling out that form I would recommend that you actually put English as your first language because that's the language you're mostly proficient in that also helps so that you don't have to do an English proficiency assessment that proves that you actually know English and can practice in English. So that would be the only extra thing that I'd like to add to that video. Clinical psychology training, again, there is a video where I speak at length about the process of applying training. Also a video that we shared about our experience during internship, which links to the next question, which is getting through master's internship and community service. So please do find those videos and watch them. And again, if there's still any questions, I will do my best to answer them. I did my internship. Actually, I did my master's and internship and community service many moons ago. But I can still try to reflect on the process itself and anything that might be helpful. But I'd need more specific questions from you guys. So the other question was, are there opportunities for a psychometrist in the UK? Honestly, this is quite a difficult question to answer because the UK has 
a very different process in terms of registrations, in terms of different people who practice. You have art therapists, you have psychotherapists, you have counseling psychologists, clinical psychologists, and those registration processes are very different. I'm more familiar with HCPC, which is the registration I fall under as a clinical psychologist. Based on a basic Google search, there are definitely opportunities in terms of work itself. In terms of registration as a psychometrist, based on the information I was able to find, you would need to register under the British Psychological Society. And within that, there is a registration of qualifications and test use. And I imagine once you are registered within that, I don't know what their process is. I remember when I did check, they also do similar processes as HCPC, which is they would want to see your qualifications. They would want to verify if the equivalent to the training you have here. So again, you would need a master's qualification for you to be able to register but that's as much as I was able to find out. I, I do hope that helps. And now moving on to future videos that I will be making. The first one is I'll make a video on consistency, but this is going to be a personal challenge because I first need to be consistent. The second one is about starting an NPO. So I'll also give you guys information about the process we went about to start an NPO and maybe share some of the experience that I've gained over the past three years now yes we've been three years i have an npo called mind matters we are three years old now and i will definitely share information about my experience with registering being part of the npo sector and just other experiences that i've had so far and things that i feel like i need to work on moving forward the next question is quite an exciting question because it also ties into the research that i'm currently doing so it says how does experiencing domestic violence affect children growing up? So I'm currently doing research on the impact of being exposed to community and school violence in adolescence. And this is honestly work that I'm passionate about. So work around trauma, work around violence. So I will firstly share some of the research findings I am coming across during my DPhil and create that into a series but specifically with domestic violence i'll also probably have to make two or three videos in relation to that thinking in terms of the impact it has in childhood how it progresses into adulthood and some of the support services that are available at these various stages of development but this does bring us to the end of our video thank you so much for watching i'll catch you guys next time